what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like. I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like. What's up, world? Welcome to another edition of I Mix What I Like Live. Again, I'm Jared Ball. Happy to be your host. Welcome again, of course, back to Black Power Media, uh, the growing and expanding channel that I know you all are enjoying, except for, as uh, <laughs> as uh, Leah points out, there is always, somebody always jumps out here early with the one quick thumbs down before we even do anything. So it's always good to get the hate out of the way. Uh, uh, but the rest of you, uh, who actually pay attention and watch what we do, please hit the like button, the share button, the subscribe button. Join if you can. And to that point, uh, shout out to uh, Nasty Zombie Hands for, for joining the channel. Welcome. Uh, and to you, Hope, welcome as well. Uh, uh, we hope that you all are going to set the precedent for today uh, and, and as many more of you can join and support this growing, expanding channel. Uh, I'm very happy to be jumping in here at 8 a.m. Uh, on a Monday because I do want to fill in uh, some of the gaps until the remix morning show goes seven days a week, uh, which I hope I'm sorry. Well, maybe, but at least five. Sorry about that. Five days a week. And we uh, uh, but I'm happy to pick up on some of these Mondays and Fridays. Uh, to maybe get our, I don't know, get us all used to it uh, uh, until that can happen. But but definitely come back tomorrow morning, 8 a.m. Eastern for the Remix Morning Show when the full crew will be here. Bunch of stories, the whole globe being discussed. Uh, a lot of fun, too. And you never know what's going to happen. Uh, and two weeks in, we've already broken national news. We're already, we're already, you know, uh, uh, we're already demonstrating what is not being done anywhere else in your media diet. So come on and get that boom bat breakfast. Um, a couple of, of other things quickly before we, we get to our, our guest, uh, who I'm very uh, excited to have with us this morning. Um, uh, and there's more I'm going to say about this. Uh, I want to keep coming back to uh, later today, in fact, uh, because we are going to still come back at 12 noon Eastern for the sort of regularly scheduled um efforts, uh, as we'll talk about in a moment. Our next guest is uh, in the UK, and we needed to to accommodate uh, his schedule. So it worked out perfectly that we could do this at 8 a.m. anyway. So, um, But uh, shout out to Dr. Ieli Ichile, part of the Remix Morning Show crew uh, and the Black Lash Collective. Uh, uh, but I want to start to do more to support an effort uh, that she's uh, launched a little while ago, and I'll look to have more information later. Uh, and to talk about this more later, uh, but the Mad Mom, Mo the Mad Money for Mamas campaign, uh, and uh, just uh, uh, fundraising for um, women of the African diaspora who have who are suffering uh, way too much uh, violence and abuse, and way too much of it happening from we men in uh, the the community. So uh, I want to support Dr. Ichile's work there. Uh, we're definitely going to come back and talk about what's going on in uh, uh, what happened this weekend with both the social media boycott. Since my remix crew is hating, uh, we're going to come back and talk about later this afternoon the re the 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 uh, social media strike uh, engaged in against racism by the European football community and the protest that led to the cancellation or the postponement of the Manchester United Liverpool game all about the very uh, U.S.-based American, North American, J.P. Morgan-backed money uh, of the Glazier family. So we definitely want to talk about that. And I'm going to come back to this, but I'm going to say it now because I am geeking out on this. But I'm going to come back and I'm going to show, we're going to talk more about this when, when, I'm, when I'm not holding up a, a, an interview. But the wise intelligent has... Uh, shouted out the myth and propaganda of black buying power uh, on Instagram. And I'm not going to front. I've been a fan since I've been a little kid or a youngin, as we used to say. And uh, that uh, one of my favorite MCs uh, still putting out some of the best uh, music uh, out uh, would say some nice things is big deal for me. Big deal for me. So 
I'm going to come back to that as well. I also want to speak of MCs, want to talk a little bit about Math Hoffa. I don't know, you know, a little kept best known. Uh, well, I don't know. It's not a secret, really, but something uh, we don't talk too much about is my fandom of the rap battle community or the battle rap community. Uh, and why did Dr. Hate say that? I am the academic equivalent to Math Hoffa. I'm going to come back and talk about that and actually talk about something that Math Hoffa said that Shaka Khan has said in recent years and others have talked about. Anyway, I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Anyway. So, all right, but we're going to come back to all of that because right now I do want to turn to uh, um, uh, my next guest, who is uh, Dr. Piers Robinson. Uh, who, among many other things, is co-director of the Organization for Propaganda Studies, in which I am also uh, a part. Uh, in, I am a, a member of that group. Um, he is also the convener of the Working Group on Syria, Propaganda and Media, and associated researcher with the Working Group on Propaganda and the 9-11 Global War on Terror. Uh, and he has served on the boards of several academic journals. Uh, he has is, he is published widely. Uh, and I've linked in the description below to his website where you can get more of his biography and see more of his work, um, internationally known for his work on propaganda uh, and media. And um, I'm very happy to have him join us here to talk a little bit about this this ongoing scandal surrounding the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons or OPCW and Syria and all that is and is not being said about it. So uh, Piers Robinson, Dr. Robinson, good morning and welcome. Thank you for joining me. It's good to see you. Good morning. It's good to be with you, John. So as I said before we got started, if you know, for, for I, I've been trying to follow this issue uh, uh, in part thanks to, to you uh, and certainly folks like Aaron Mate and others. Uh, but but uh, before I get to anything about why I think this is important uh, for, for, for our particular audience or my little show here, uh, I, as I was saying off the air, could you give us sort of that that elevator pitch or that summary explanation that when, when someone comes to you who who is an expert in all of this and says something that they heard on the the, the you know, one of the local, in fact, one of the latest reports that said, "Hey, the OPCW confirmed that uh, 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 President Assad used uh, chlorine and chemical weapons on his own population." Hey, we we got them right. Let's go get. What do you say to folks right out of the gate? Uh, to get the conversation started? Well, the controversy over the OPCW, the, or as you said, the Organization for Pro Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, and, and this is the international body which is set up um, in order to assess um, whether chemical weapons have been used and now has, has the power to actually um, attribute blame for the use of chemical weapons. This organization, uh, or part of this organization through fact-finding missions, have been uh, very closely involved with the ongoing war in Syria, which has been going on since 2011. And one of the key features of the, of the war in Syria has been repeated allegations over chemical weapons use. Uh, these allegations have been made against opposition groups and against the Syrian government. And the OPCW naturally has been tasked with investigating these. And the controversy, there's, in a sense, there's always been a lot of controversy over alleged chemical weapons attacks in Syria. Syrian government denies being involved. Russia denies the Syrian government being involved. French, British, and American governments usually blame the Syrian government. So it's, it's the heart of a controversy in a major war which has been going on a long time. And where the OPCW controversy, which has really been going on for a couple of years, three years now, is that there was a, pr a prominent alleged chemical weapon attack in Douma in Syria in 2018. And it was followed within seven days by France, America and Britain bombing Syria in retaliation. What then happened was an investigation team got in on the ground from the OPCW, and this is one of the first times the team had actually been able to get in on the ground and wasn't simply reliant upon information being passed to them from groups within Syria. The team who went to Syria came back and wrote up an original, uh, uh, an initial report, and it was clearly indicating that uh, there was a very strong possibility that no attack had happened. And another way of, of, look, of looking at that, saying that is that the, the events were staged. Um, now, that report was um, secretly changed within the OPCW without the knowledge of the team, and that created um, one of the team protesting internally. And that was the start of the controversy, which has rolled on since then. 
And since then, there's been a final report, which has very much supported the, the American, British and French line that the Syrian government carried out the attack. And then there have been many leaks and, and testimony, uh, talks at UN Security Council, informal meetings and at formal meetings, um, where essentially um, serious concerns by at least two of the inspectors about manipulation of the investigation have been articulated. And that takes us to what the big issue is here, is, is, is that the concern is that the OPCW has been manipulated by the US, French and the UK in order to ensure that a report was uh, put out that blamed the Syrian government. And that this isn't true. This has been uh, attained through manipulation. And so the broader concern there is that, is it the case that the OPCW and is it the case that other claims about alleged chemical weapons use have actually been more akin to propaganda than to objective claims and analysis of what's going on? So, so that's the story in a nutshell. And that's why there's controversy around the OPCW. And it's a controversy which, frankly, does elevate or it gets uh, to a higher and higher level all the time. I mean, there are... There's uh, UN Security Council meetings discussing this and, and so on. Um, but that's controversy. And I guess the broader backdrop, and this is where I come in in terms of earlier research I've done, the kind of underlying question being raised, is, is this what we see in Syria not dissimilar to what we saw with Iraq in 2003 and the manipulation of intelligence in order to suggest Iraq had a, a serious WMD, weapons of mass destruction capability, which it didn't have as we now know, but was used in order to mobilize political and public support to invade the country. And so uh, at the backdrop of this, and this has been raised by some of the prominent voices like Colonel Wilkerson, for example, that it, it, is this somewhat similar to something that we've seen before and we have it going on right now um, with a major organization which is supposed to be independent, obviously, um, but in which clearly some of the scientists have been essentially trying to blow the whistle or trying to raise a concern that all is not well within the organization. That's my uh, introduction. I hope that's clear uh, enough. Um, well, you. well, I, I mean, I think so, but but uh, uh, in a moment, uh, um, uh, again, intentionally, I'm not checking out the the comments or the chat yet. Uh, so I'll come back in a minute to see about the comments and questions there, because it so often will get uh, uh, lively to the point of of even positive distraction. So uh, a lot of comedians, and and as I always say, we have a, a relatively small but very thoughtful audience here. So you know, it gets it, it can get you know. So I'm gonna I'm gonna come back to that to 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 that side in a minute and we'll see to what extent things are not clear and maybe ask you a few questions but um one quick point uh, to that comparison to 2003 is that that the the duma attack in 2018 wa was used to uh, uh bring cover to uh further uh, um, airstrikes from the United States, oh. France, um, and uh, it, I don't know, at least those two uh, off the top of my head. Uh, where France, UK, and the US, the three countries, right, they were right, the three right, countries right. who initiated uh, bombing uh, about seven days later. Right. Uh, and then we all heard in the news here, you know, this was the barrel bomb stuff. This was the, you know, Assad must go stuff. And and uh, something that I would just use in my own classroom, uh, but practice personally is is just to say, uh, you know, start off with, well, to what extent do any of us know anything about Syria? Let's start there uh, before we start assessing to what extent any of this is accurate. Uh, and then when I started, I don't know, probably, I don't know, maybe from your work, maybe from um, Aaron Mate or other, I don't know, whenever I started seeing the criticism, uh, and then over f trying to follow it over the last few years and then and then just seeing, well, wait a minute, it doesn't make any sense. So so we end up having a situation where what is it? Fifty some people, uh, uh, you know, are now uh, dead, said to be killed by Assad. Uh, but if, as you're saying, the evidence shows that this was not, in fact, what happened, uh, then we have not only a staged murder that has gone unsolved, a mass murder. Um, but then, then uh, the political use of that to to further uh, bomb, uh, you know, and uh, at least nominally sovereign sovereign country. Um, before we get any farther, uh, could you could you talk a little bit about what some of the other political reasons? Why would the French, UK, and US want to be getting rid of Assad? Why would they be looking for another reason to get back in there? 
Um, uh, could you say a few words about that? And then I do want to get to the specifics of, of how we've come to the, con well, at least how you and others, and then I have come to this conclusion that what we've been told is uh, propaganda and, and untrue. But why would the US and, and UK and France want to, what would incentivize them to, to, to support uh, um, a lie and, and uh, mm. uh, this mythology? Sure. I mean, the, the war on Syria, which has been going on since 2011, um, it's useful to contextualize it in, in the broader global war on terror. Um, and, and if you go back to the start of the war on terror, you, you see, um, as has been confirmed in documents, uh, communications between Tony Blair and George Bush, um, and also... Um, Who's now being rehabilitated as a good guy over here. Yeah, I know. He, he's coming back. He's, he's coming back. Uh, countries such as Syria and Iran were listed as targets um, along with Iraq. Um, so these are all countries which have been seen as enemies of the West. Um, relations have sort of waxed and waned, but generally there's been sort of persistent hostility. And so in Syria, the, the drive to overthrow the Syrian government really needs to be seen in terms of the broader context of Western strategic objectives in the region, uh, objectives to try to contain Iran, for example, try to uh, limit or to break states who are not seen as um, our allies. And the, the war on Syria, although it started with demonstrations um, and pro-democracy movement, it was certainly very quickly, those protests were very quickly uh, hijacked or infiltrated by more extremist groups. And it's a matter of public record now that, uh, for example, Operation Timber Sycamore, which was a CIA Saudi operation, um, which was essentially aimed at bringing in extremist groups um, in order to try to overthrow the Syrian government. That started to unroll fairly quickly at the start of the conflict. And so, you know, in, in, in pursuit of strategic objectives of trying to remove uh, an enemy, in inverted commas, state, just as with Iraq, uh, the, the Syrian war has drawn in, or, or some would argue has been fueled almost primarily by the US, its allies, and its allies in the region, the Gulf states in the region, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, and so on. Um, and, and that's where it fits. So the aim is to get rid of a government which um, isn't playing ball, which is uh, something which is familiar to most students of American history. Um, where the issue of chemical weapons comes in and, and the allegations, of course, is, is that it serves the interests of Western governments to promote a, a narrative that the Syrian government is responsible for illegal use of, of weapons and chem use of chemical weapons, etc., in order to demonize the regime. Now, w without sort of taking any position on that, and we certainly know in wartime that demonization of the enemy is, is, is part and parcel of war propaganda. It happens in every single war, and, and it's happened in the past, it happens now, and it will happen in the future. And so this kind of allegation that the Syrian government can be uh, sort of blamed or held responsible for chemical weapons attack obviously sort of helps feed into and support the broader policy strategy of, of maintaining um, for a long time, essentially direct support for groups fighting the Syrian government, but also over the last year, the sanctions regime against the Syrian government, uh, which is designed to try to break the Syrian government. And so uh, I, that's the idea, is, or that is the thesis, is, is that the sort of claims, false claims, potentially about chemical weapons use helps reinforce the propaganda narrative, which helps underpin the basic policy. Um, and stops people from saying, wait a minute, should we really be doing this? Or stops people from saying, well, what groups are we supporting in the country? And, and I do think that in, in the last couple of years, uh, that there's been more awareness in the West that the groups that have been supported um, are what we would describe as extremist groups. I think people such as Tulsi Gabbard have, have been very clear that sort of we're effectively supporting Al Qaeda like linked, like or linked groups in Syria, extremist groups, um, and and so on. And uh, you know that we're really ultimately involved in a dirty war in Syria. Um, so if you're involved in a dirty war and you're supporting groups who um, you, you don't really want the public to be particularly aware of, you know, obviously trying to shift all the blame and all the demonization onto the enemies is, is one way of doing that. 
And, and, you know, dirty wars, we saw it in Central America, obviously, in the 80s. We've seen it in Afghanistan. Um, you know, this is, uh, it is a feature of, a, of Western foreign policy, as well as the foreign policy of other states around the world, but we're from the West. It's been a feature of Western uh, governments and the U.S. that support for extremist groups and dirty wars, as they're described, um, are a feature of our foreign policies, and it's these are almost sort of dirty secrets that we, we try to keep. Um, but uh, this is what has been going on in Syria to a significant extent, um, and allegations of, of chemical weapons use feeds into maintaining uh, the sort of public lack of awareness of the dirty war involved in and, and keeps the focus on on the the official enemy as, as chomsky would would just mm. would, a term he would use and so that that would be well that that is the the explanation that a lot of it is propaganda um and and that's the burning question now in relation to the chemical weapons attacks because of what happened at doom and because of the way in which scientists within the organization started to blow the whistle and said wait a minute we're having our reports changed um information is being redacted and removed and so on well, let's um, talk about that because because that's that's um uh you know, because after this 2018 attack happens, uh, the the initial report comes out um, and says that Assad attacked his own people with chlorine and chemical weapons. How did what caused you to go from maybe being skeptical to to finally, you know, concluding as you have that this is not real and that we're 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 being sold, uh, you know, a, 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 a myth. Um, uh, yeah. So let's start. If you, you know, how how did you? you know, well, how did you initially, there, 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 were, there was skepticism, and I remember doing an interview on Sky News uh, uh, in between the alleged attack and the airstrikes, and and I and I said, well, it, it's not clear what interest the Syrian government would have in carrying out a chemical attack just as it's about to retake this area. It would only bring in airstrikes. And many other prominent people, uh, Admiral Lord West in the UK, raised exactly the same skepticism. And so I think my initial position was to be skeptical. This doesn't really quite make sense. But then it was more the amount of information which came out. That because this was an area which was quickly uh, regained by the Syrian government, the OPCW were able to get in on the ground. And there was a lot of visibility around this. And quite prominently early on, the Russian Federation actually took a group of witnesses who were at a hospital scene associated with the alleged attack. And the witnesses said that you know this wasn't a chemical attack, that the children had been invited in and, and they'd been splashed with water and so on. But that was essentially staged. There was already a lot of information coming out which didn't look right. And there's also a lot of skepticism that it made no sense for the Syrian government to launch such an attack. So I was skeptical from, from the beginning, which I think is reasonable to be skeptical of it, you know, until you get more information. The really damning information which has emerged through leaks and testimony from OPCW scientists ha has been, for example, what I described earlier was that the, the original interim report, which contained a whole series of very serious questions about what had happened, one of which was an assessment from four NATO toxicologists the, the victims in the building could not have been killed from chlorine. Okay, that the arrangement, the, the way everyone appeared to have dropped dead on the spot and so on, um, simply didn't fit chlorine. It, fin it fitted sarin, a nerve agent, but not chlorine. And of course, no sarin was ever found. And it became, well, it's a chemical attack. Uh, so it's, it's a chlorine attack. Um, and so that kind of evidence, which was which you can see being suppressed in the final uh, interim report, started to raise a very big red flag. Well, this this looks like you've actually got some serious manipulation going on with respect to the investigation, and and actually, although people don't tend to look at the details in the science, it, it's not too complicated to see why questions were being raised by the inspectors who went in because one of the chlorine cylinders is supposed to have landed on a, on, on a roof balcony punched a hole in the roof, but then not gone through. And then chlorine gas came down and filtered down through three or four stories and then uh, and then supposedly into a basement. And that it was killing people and people were literally just dropping dead on the spot. 
Whereas normally with, with chlorine gas, people, you know, you're not killed immediately. People can hold their breath and, and, and move away. So th there's some obvious questions being raised. And then finding out that the scientists had raised these questions and the NATO toxicologists had raised this question, um, that how on earth did so many people die in one spot in that way? And there's film of all of this, of course, as well. Um, started to suggest this doesn't look right at all. And then perhaps the, the, the real development was after the final report came out, an engineering study which had been um, initiated by one of the people involved in the investigation, which had been blocked by OPCW management, actually drew very um, important conclusions about the cylinder and its ability to punch a hole in the roof and leave as little damage as it did on the cylinder. So you, you had this kind of big yellow cylinder which punched a hole in a roof and with steel metal bars splayed out underneath. And this engineering study said, well, that, that doesn't make any sense. That there would be a lot more damage on the cylinder. And why would the cylinder bend these bars through more than 90 degrees and have one bar stopping it? It simply, mechanically speaking, didn't make much sense. And that, that uh, engineering report, as we found out, was leaked, um, but that had been blocked effectively by the OPCW. So that was the point at which I think in my own mind and sort of being coming more and more involved in this and as people know my working group's been in contact with people within the OPCW, um, it became more apparent that you've got some essentially, I, I think scientific fraud is, is, is not too strong a word, you've got some fraud going on with the scientific investigation. Can, can um, I you have can, I'm sorry to interrupt, but can, I, I'm, can we just back up for a quick second? What is the OPCW beyond its title? How did it get formed? Who is, how is it comprised? Uh, because I think this is important in terms of understanding what ends up happening here and why some, why you got some information, uh, um, I guess, leaked to you um, or I don't know, whatever. Um, but, but what's going on? What is this thing? The OPCW. Well, the OPCW was set up in the 1990s, and it was there to um, essentially try as, as a component um, of, of trying to enforce the Chemical Weapons Convention and trying to, and it's a UN-linked organization, trying to go about the very noble and important job of trying to eliminate the use of chemical weapons. So, so that's where it comes from. It's, it's part of, it's a UN-linked body, and it's there to try to um, as it were, realize the ambitions of the Chemical Weapons Convention and try to end the use of these weapons in warfare. So at least in theory, it's not supposed to be beholden to the UK. It's, it's not supposed to be beholden. Mm -hmm. and, and there's a really interesting bit of history, which is quite important, is, is that Bastar, Jose Bastani, who was the first director general of the OPCW, he was famously ousted from the OPCW in the run-up to the Iraq war by John Bolton and the US government. Uh, and he reports it in terms of he, he wasn't willing to play ball with the Americans because they obviously wanted to build their narrative of Saddam having weapons of mass destruction. The OPCW was creating a block to that, um, and Jose Bustani was famously kicked out by John Bolton and the Americans. And so, in, in a sense, you have a very early indicator of of, of the, start, the start of the breakdown of the full independence of the OPCW from the US and are able to get rid of its leader, um, the director general, because they're not getting the answers they want, uh, which they need in order to help invade Iraq. Now, that, that does bring us, and I'm glad you've raised this, this brings us to a very important point about Syria, is that the key thing about Syria is that the criticism of the OPCW is, is not so much about the organization as a whole as about the fact-finding missions which have been set up to investigate alleged attacks in Syria. Because what is unusual about the investigations in Syria is that the fact-finding missions report to what's called the Office of the Director General, and they don't report directly to the scientific, the verification uh, divisions of the OPCW. And what that enables in the case of Syria is potentially political influence from the US and, and the French and the British on the conduct of the investigations. And this is one of the concerns which has been raised uh, by people within the organization over the last two years, is that what they're doing in the case of Syria is not proper, fully independent uh, scientific analysis, free from political pressure. And just to add one additional point, the, the, the chief of cabinet um, during Duma 
uh, which is a key position in the Office of Director General, was a career British diplomat, replaced by a French career diplomat. The Director General of the OPCW um, at the time of Duma was a, a Turkish career diplomat. So these are all individuals who come from countries who are belligerents in the war. France, the UK, Turkey, America have all been trying to overthrow the Syrian government. And so I think that's, that, that's helped me help to explain people why this organization and why in particular the Syria operations have become vulnerable to political influence. And this is one of, um, I don't want to bombard too much information, but one of the things which has emerged over the last two years from people within the OPCW is that the, the Duma team, before their interim report was finally put out, they were paid a visit from three American officials who then told them very politely what had happened at Duma. Uh, what that actually is, it's okay for governments to share information important for an investigation, but what's not okay is for a country to send some officials to actually meet and talk to an investigation team, actually get know who they are, and then tell them what happened, which is essentially what happened in the case of Duma. And that's a very clear example of, um, at the time, the British career diplomat in, in charge of that, allowing something to happen, which arguably, and um, probably is the case, is in violation of the Chemical Weapons Convention, that you're not supposed to allow states' parties to have that kind of ability to influence um, an ongoing investigation. Um, so that that's in a nutshell, that especially with the Syria FFMs, that the independence of the OPCW has been compromised and it's ended up potentially um, and probably actually uh, being influenced by countries who are directly involved in the war. And, and America, um, for those of your viewers who don't know, I mean, America occupies a significant section in the oil fields of Syria and continues to. So I think it's about a third of the country. Um. Mm. Mm. um okay so so within the last uh okay so so again but but come back to the to the to the to the rest of the story that i think i cut off where where um you come to be clear beyond again the skepticism the initial skepticism that that you know every this is all wrong um, of course, leading up to what was, was it last week in the European Parliament where people were being, you know, I think the Irish reps were being shut down uh, uh, by the, 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 the French woman who formally helped lead the French wing of the invasion or the, the bombing. Wow. Of Syria. I mean, this last week, I mean, when I, I was watching some of that, again, I got to credit Aaron Maté for this. I was watching his coverage of this and he, of course, testified. Uh, at the UN uh, involved in, in his own coverage of this, but, but, but for you, the, anyway, please finish that story that, that brings us up to the nonsense that happened uh, this past week. Well, so I, I run through some of the kind of key mm -hmm. uh, sort of bits of evidence, which has emerged, which, which turns me sure. from skepticism into thinking, yeah, this, this does this clearly something has gone badly wrong here. Um, a key feature, really, from the very beginning, even from the initial final, when the final report was published, mm -hmm. um, there was a call from the Russian Federation then to allow inspectors who had been raising concerns to be heard. And they were saying, look, okay, there's a Duma team, and there's a core team, and then there's other inspectors who are being sidelined. Can we just have them all get together and talk about the evidence? And so there was an immediate block. I think it was the French and the British blocked that and wouldn't allow that. We were not, we are, we're not going to allow the, all of the inspectors to speak. And ever since then, and as has emerged from the testimony from OP, the OPCW scientists, repeated attempts to, to make eminently reasonable requests to say, can, can we just allow the teams to sit down and to talk about the evidence, because some of it looks as though it's been misused, have been blocked again and again. And it's reached extreme levels of Jose Bastani, the first director general of the OPCW, who has supported the scientists, was supposed to speak at a UN Security Council meeting. And the, and the Americans and the French or one of our allies just blocked him from talking. He wasn't allowed to speak. And, and this, this, is, this is, you know, another element of helping people understand that something has gone wrong is that 
the response from the OPCW and the response from the, from the British, French, and, and, and Americans has been not to say, okay, let's just talk about the evidence. Their response has to, has to be block that from happening and then to accuse anybody raising questions of being a conspiracy theorist, of being a Russian stooge, um, of being an assadist, of being a war crimes denier, all of those usual terms you see thrown out to try and smear people and not answering really straightforward questions. Um, and, and that takes us up to what you described last week when uh, two MEPs, uh, European Parliament um, uh, politicians, Mick Wallace and Claire Daly, confronted the Director General of the OPCW and, and put questions to the Director General in a, in a security meeting in the European Council, uh, in the European Union. And uh, quite a, aside from the fact that the Director General did not answer the questions, the chair actually tried to close down <laughs> the questioning. Uh, and the, the chair was, uh, funnily enough, was in the French government at the time of Duma and also publicly making allegations against the Syrian government at the time. And this was closed and blocked down. So you're not yeah, I'm guessing. Just showing the, the video here, the, yeah. the link I'm putting in the description to, to Aaron Mate's coverage of this. But but uh, I mean, if you watch it, I mean, he's saying like, he, he, you know, and he's, he's literally, he and his colleague uh, who tries to raise the same question, as you point out, uh, they're literally shut down uh, by the chair of the committee who was in the French government when they used the attack in Duma as an excuse to drop more bombs on Syria. And to the point, I just want, if you could also add, when you come back, because I did want to ask you about the Russiagate side of all of this, that 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 this is connected to this ongoing, uh, Russia is behind everything, and Russia is, of course, supporting Assad, so that it, therefore anybody who who uh, is critical of what happened it, it, it there is, is, as you said, a Russian stooge. Uh, yeah. Anyway, but I, I I just wanted to let folks know what I was showing here. Um, I mean, it's 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 fast. <laughs> it's crazy. Anyway, please go ahead. So, so, so in, in a way, I mean, looking at this in, in, in as objective a way as possible is, is that these are perfectly reasonable questions which have been raised now over two years, starting with why did somebody in secret take the interim report and modify it and then try to publish it only to be caught out by one of the team? Why on earth did that happen? Who did that? Who, who was instructing that to happen? No answer to that question. Um, and, and a whole host of other questions, the NATO toxicologist, the engineering report. And it would have been quite easy, actually, right from the beginning, for the OPCW to take the decision to say, well, we have credible, eminent people from this organization who are raising serious questions. Let's just get them to sit down perhaps in a protected environment, but sit down with other members of the team and to thrash out the differences. That could have been done from day one. And I suspect um, you know, that would have resolved, essentially, um, perhaps not in the favor of, of what the British and Americans wanted, but it would re resolve the scientific issues. But that has just never been allowed. There's just been a, a, an absolute desire not to do that. And I think that's why people such as Aaron Matea are so comfortable describing this as a cover-up. Because a cover-up happens when you're stopping people from being able to talk, when you're stopping scientists from being able to talk. And um, it is worth adding at this point that the two most prominent scientists who have raised questions are extremely experienced, long, were long-serving members of the OPCW. They're not just you know, the, the guy or the girl who made the coffee, as it were. <laughs> they are extremely experienced. And so if you're in any, in any organization where you have serious indications of wrongdoing. For example, a sexual assault allegation, people within an organization. If you're ahead of that organization, you'd say, right, we need to have this properly discussed and so on. Um, and that has never been allowed. So the, the, the reasonable conclusion a lot of people draw is that the West is covering up what happened, um, that the West is, is not confident um, in its allegations it's making, that it's not confident in the legality of the bombing that it carried out carried out against Syria in response to Duma. And they're just trying to bury the story and bury it by smearing people, etc., um, and refusing to answer questions. 
um, and two, three, well, two years down the line and three years since the event, and with this still going on, I think that's not an unreasonable conclusion to reach. Um, all of this could be resolved by allowing the scientists all to sit down and engage in a proper, in, in a sense, transparent, but initially perhaps protected environment in order to go through the science um, and to work out where things seem to have gone wrong. Um, and it's just not being allowed to happen, unfortunately. Um, Can you, I just want to make sure you're hearing me because I think I'm, I'm struggling over here with my connection yeah. again. I don't know why, but anyway, but, uh, um, uh, so can we just talk, if you would, a few minutes about the, the propaganda part of all of this and how, how you've seen it it, it, it going? Um, again, I agree, you know, when Aaron Mate describes this as now, he's, he describes it really more as a media issue now. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, anyway, it's kind of similar to a lot of arguments that could be made that when you look at something with, with just a little bit, just just a little bit, the 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 math or the science is pretty clear this is it, it can't be what is being claimed um but yet i was just looking in preparation for today i mean in the the latest stories if you put opcw in in just a regular search the latest stories all say hey opcw says you know basically the west was right to to bomb this guy you know you know assad used weapons against his own people and it's almost it, there's almost no discussion of the the conflict within the OPCW with the, with the 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 suppressed reports, all the stuff you're describing here, and and even you know in so-called alternative media spaces, uh, this issue is not either discussed at all, or it's discussed following the same standard mainstream talking points. Mm -hmm. uh, so could you talk a little bit about again? from the perspective of someone who studies propaganda and media systems, what has been going on um, or, or how does this maybe, uh, um, I think you mentioned this already, how does this follow a trend or a pattern uh, that you've noticed just in your, your work generally? Well, in, in some ways, this is nothing new when it comes to media and war. I mean, we know anybody who studies uh, media and conflict um, over the course of time will know that in wartime, the media is particularly compliant and deferential to government positions. And, and the Syrian war is no different from that. Um, and, and it certainly is the case, as, as I'm sure Aaron Maté and, and his colleague Max Blumenthal will, will explain, and, and also anybody else who's raised questions about the dirty war I was talking about in, in relation to Syria, you can't talk about those things without being attacked relentlessly, not just by activists, but by the mainstream media who bracket you as conspiracy theorists and so on. Um, and in some ways, this is just a, this is what you see in wartime. In the Vietnam War, people who are opposed to that conflict were accused of being, you know, pro-communist sympathizer and, and so on and so forth. Um, and so, in a way, this is this is just the usual wartime propaganda. Um, pressure and incentives are placed in the mainstream media, and they don't like to challenge what's going on. Sometimes challenges emerge, but as you know, in the Vietnam War, that came. Up quite late in that conflict. It wasn't until 67, 68 that you started to see a real body of critical journalism emerging in relation to that war. The Iraq war, there was some criticism in the UK before the invasion of Iraq, but less so in America. And it wasn't really until after the invasion of Iraq that you had more criticism emerging. And so, you know, wartime I remember, propaganda is a power. I'm sorry to interrupt thing. again, but I remember when Condoleezza Rice said at one point uh, after the invasion in 2003, the re invasion, she said, I remember she went to make an appeal for more funding, be, uh, uh, specifically for uh, uh, for prop, prop, and she didn't use the word uh, propaganda, but for that because she said the war will be fought in the newsrooms around the world yeah. more than on any battlefield. Uh, so we need more money for those operations. Uh, anyway, sorry. Yeah, yeah. So, so wartime propaganda is 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 a feature of of, of Western wars. Um, and so in some ways, this kind of blockade on controversial topics is not surprising. And it's something which we'd expect. What is unusual about what we have with the Duma OPCW controversy is that at some point, you know, the propaganda facade starts to break down. In the Vietnam War, that happened particularly around the Tet Offensive, as you know, when 
Um, you had the uprising throughout South Vietnam, and you had a lot of critical reporting starting to emerge. Um, and Walter Cronkite, I think, gave that famous um, CBS broadcast where he talked about sort of, you know, maybe we need to navigate our way out of this conflict. At some point, things start to break. And of course, you have the Pentagon Papers in the case of the, the Iraq war. What's surprising about Duma, and, and, and some mainstream journalists have covered this, Peter Hitchens in the UK has been covering this issue, um, and in a sense, supporting the, the scientists and the whistleblowers. Um, what's so surprising here is that you actually have, it's not just a case of people's opinion or positions, you actually have leaked documents and whistleblowers who are coming out. And you would kind of expect that maybe more of the mainstream media in that situation would start to take the issue seriously and start to engage it more fully. And that hasn't happened in this case. And my own personal explanation for this is that I think that the kind of intensity of propaganda around the, the uh, Syrian war, but also really in a sense the power of the media itself to start to try to be more autonomous is, is actually reduced now than what it was in earlier eras. I think the media is even more contained and compressed towards the government than we've seen in earlier eras. And at the same time, the propaganda around the Syrian war has been, been ferocious. As I say, anyone who opens their mouth questioning the official narrative is immediately accused of, of everything under the sun and so on, and has to put up with that in terms of, of being attacked. And so I, I think we're just, it seems that we might be in an era where you know, we're in an earlier era where, say, the OPCW whistleblowers would have been listened to and more of the mainstream media, as you had with Vietnam, would start to say, wait a minute, we need to start asking some much more fundamental questions about what's going on here. Uh, that seems to have gone. And that's one of the worrying things, I think, about this episode is that at the point at which you have experienced scientists and leaked documents all indicating that something has clearly gone wrong, um, you, and also a lot of prominent people supporting uh, the whistleblowers, you'd sort of expect um, more of those mainstream journalists who are always risk averse, right, when it comes to foreign policy. Um, you'd expect that perhaps a few more of them might have thought, well, okay, let's at least start covering both sides of the issue um, rather than simply sort of, as it were, demonizing or denigrating um, the scientists primarily in, in this case um, who, who have blown the whistle. So we do seem to be in maybe darker times now in terms of um, the, the mainstream media having a, any ability to, to really challenge in, in, a, in a significant way what their governments are doing, even in wars which have gone on for a very, very long time. Um. Mm. Hey, well, listen, uh, uh, Dr. Robinson, uh, I think the, the only question I saw in the chat uh, that I that I caught, if, and if I missed any, please quickly uh, re, re, uh, submit it, was, was related to the, um, the resources in Syria uh, that I think you did mention uh, that might be some of the incentive for, for the West's involvement there. Um, uh, but just quick, could you just quickly restate some of what, what, what it's, it, the, the resources that, that are... Uh, because I know, and then some of this is also connected to the desire for for a pipeline and all of this other kind of stuff going through that whole region uh, that that Syria is, I guess, being inconvenient. <laughs> sure, I mean, I mean, I mean, it, it is a fact that that I I, I think it's, it's a maybe up to a third of the country where the oil fields are is is, is effectively under the occupation of, of, of U.S. Um, forces and, and allied groups allied to the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I suspect the kind of geostrategic motivations are, are less the kind of sort of we want to get in there to steal all the oil so much as it's about power and footprint in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. And so the same kind of issues with Saddam Hussein, uh, Gaddafi in Libya and so on. You have powerful countries with cohesive states, with rich in resources, but they're not in your camp. Um, and I think sort of the underlying ge geostrategic motivation, as, as far as I can see, is that the, the war against Syria fits into the broader strategy in the Middle East to try to contain Iran, try to prevent Russian Chinese influence in the region, and try to, as it were, exert as much power, as much control as you can over, in general, what is a key resource region, obviously oil um, and so on. Um, and that's what's motivating. So it's a complex kind of picture, um, but ultimately the sort of the motivation and the goal is, is a fairly simple one, and, it, and it's about uh, power and control in the region. 
And this is, you know, nothing new. I, I remember in the run up to the Iraq invasion, so some students were being, it was being pointed out to them that, well, as British troops go into Iraq again, that they'll be coming across some graves of British soldiers who died there at the beginning of the 20th century. You know, sort of Western involvement in the Middle East, the overthrow of the Iranian government in, in, in the early 50s and so on. Western history in the Middle East is one of alliances with our um, the Gulf states and trying to maintain influence and control in, in a key a resource region. Um, and the, the motivation on Syria, I think broadly speaking, fits into that. Um, those uh, re real politics sort of geostrategic um, ambitions on, on the part of the West. And then an ambition which is struggling today. I mean, you know, the war in Afghanistan continues, but there is, as everybody knows, a lot of resistance and a lot of resistance throughout the Middle East to uh, what some people describe as Western imperialism. Um, and we are definitely in a phase where, I mean, the, certainly the influence of countries such as China, but also Iran, and to a certain extent, the Russian Federation, um, is probably stronger than it was 10, 20 years ago in the region. Um, and this brings us to a broader question of where the West is now in the international system. Uh, you know, we are in a period of significant change, significant shift in the balance of power. And one of the reactions, and I, has, I, I think this is reasonably uncontroversial, or at least Chomsky would, would argue it, that you know, the West has has tried to maintain its position in the international system, and it's used a lot of military force in order to try and do that. And you know, all of the wars that we've seen, all of the military deployments that we've seen over the last 20 years, really can be seen as part of that attempt by a dominant set of states, an empire, if you will, uh, trying to hold on to control as things change in the international system and as countries such as China and other significant powers such as India become much more powerful economically and much more confident about um, demanding um, sort of that they are heard or demanding their sort of piece of the cake, so to speak. Um, and, and the West has been, as, as I'm sure a lot of your viewers know, have been caught up in a lot of belligerent foreign policy, very destructive. Just a little bit here or there. Life. Just, just, just a little, little bit here or there. there. Just a little bit. Um, and and Syria fits into in into that bigger dynamic that we're seeing, and and it, this all matters, of course. I mean, I know we're coming close. So this all matters, and, and the OPCW issue, in a sense, is connected to this, because this is is to do with war. And if, if you look at countries such as Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, Libya, the death toll associated with these conflicts, which the West has been very much behind driving, runs into undoubtedly millions of indirect and direct deaths. Um, this is a, a, ver a horrifically large number of people are dying, not indirectly, but really directly as a result of, of the war fighting that the West has engaged in. And it's a difficult, it's a bitter pill for people in the West to swallow. Um, but I, I, I think the empirical record is pretty clear. All governments around the world can do bad things and the Russian Federation and the Chinese do bad things, et cetera, et cetera. But what we're talking about is the kind of warfare that we've seen, the, the, the open warfare that we've seen for 20 years plus. Um, and it is ultimately very destructive and it, and it does result in terrible loss of life and terrible suffering. Um, and that's why we should care. We should care as people, as people in a democracy. Um, and we should also care about where it might take us in terms of bigger wars against China or Russia, for example, China in particular. Uh, some commentators such as John Pilger are very concerned that Western belligerents will inevitably drag us into a horrendous conflict with China at some point in the next 20 years. And these are all scenarios that we don't want our children and ourselves to have to live through. Um, we need to, as we try to do after the Second World War, the UN, you want to try and find ways of resolving problems in the international system through peaceful means, avoiding conflict. Um, and I think in my view on the West is the West has very much lost its way with respect to that. And uh, certainly in the last 20 years, arguably a lot longer than that. Um, where we have, through a variety of means, used force and aggression in ways which is not compatible with our own notions of, of being peace-loving and so on. Um, and and these, are, these are big challenges, and 
you know, we have a responsibility, I think, as citizens to try to be aware of what's going on, to try to, you know, try to make sure our governments are accountable for what's going on, whether it's Afghanistan, Iraq, or Syria, or Libya. Right on. Well, Dr. Piers Robinson, thank you very much. I really appreciate you jumping on with us this morning and uh, look uh, forward to having you back again, as I'm sure the issue of propaganda will uh, <laughs> persist. Um, but I appreciate you. Thank you very much again. And uh, 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 please, folks, uh, check his uh, the link in the description for more on uh, Dr. Robinson's work uh, and uh, uh, check it out. So, again, thank you very much. Appreciate your time. Thanks, Sarah. Good to talk to you. Likewise. All right, everybody. Uh, thanks again to Dr. Robinson. Um, uh, we'll be looking to talk more with him and actually some more of the, the folks in this organization for propaganda studies. Uh, I continue to learn a lot from them. And uh, uh, there's, there's uh, <laughs> still so much to get to. Um, just very quickly, uh, I saw some of the comments, uh, again, a very vigorous discussion. L listen, and I hope I'm not, uh, yeah, I guess I, could, I hope I'm not freezing too much here, but uh, just before I wrap up, please come back at 12 noon, if you can, Eastern. Uh, we're going to uh, get into a couple of more stories, and then I have uh, uh, a very special guest coming on at one o'clock. I'm going to do a couple of things at 12, including talking about... Um, why is intelligence support for the myth and propaganda of black buying power? I definitely want to talk a little bit about Math Hoffa uh, and something he said uh, during his recent discussion of, of his battles and uh, why Dr. Haight says that I am the academic equivalent to Math Hoffa. I also want to talk a little bit about that, that football issue. Uh, you know what? I didn't ask Dr. Robinson about, uh, should have brought it anyway. Uh, uh, the, 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 the man, man United, uh, Liverpool game that got postponed, uh, and then, and definitely want to talk more about the, the mad money for mamas, uh, Dr. Ichile's, uh, campaign. Uh, I want to have a, a little bit of a discussion with you all on that as well. Um, but very quickly on the comments, um, some of the discussion about Aaron Mate, and then some people have gotten at me about uh, my reference continuously to Jimmy Dore and others. Let me just say this quickly before I wrap up for now. Um, as I've said to some other people, I watch Jimmy Dore as a replacement for CNN and MSNBC. You get all, you get a better, you get better information uh, in terms of uh, daily sort of mainstream news coverage from him than you do from the military industrial complex sponsored news uh, that is the mainstream in this country. Uh, and I look to Aaron Mate in the gray zone and, and others as, as again, that kind of alternative to the mainstream. This is not a personality thing. I, I don't know these gentlemen personally. I assume we have many disagreements. Look, Aaron ignored me when I asked him to cover Mumia. Uh, he ignored me also when I asked him, you know, to, to engage me in a discussion of why you would interview Peniel Joseph about Kwame Ture, which I would again argue is the equivalent, uh, as I said to him, of interviewing Rachel Maddow about Russiagate. <laughs> I still think that's a good joke. <laughs> but but my point is, we don't all have to. This is not I'm not. The, the point is, is the information good? Is the reporting good? And Aaron has been fantastic on the issue of Russiagate and, and Syria and OPCW and many other things. So if you want information, this is not about do I like him? Do I know him? Uh, in fact, I, I think I like his father's work uh, uh, probably more if I had to rate something. And and in fact, in their discussion, his father was more right on, on the issue of, of uh, Obama, for instance, than Aaron was. Uh, but anyway, but my point is, what difference does that make? This is we need information. We need we we, <laughs> we can come together in our own organized spaces and analyze the information and interpret the information how we want and then proceed from that as we would like. But the information is essential. So I don't I don't I never understand why people, you know, they people contact me like, well, you, you made reference to Jimmy Dore and he's a jerk. I, 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 all right. But his his analysis on mainstream news is correct. Uh, and I don't even know if he is a jerk or not. I'm just saying his analysis is correct on that stuff. I'm not asking him to talk about the African world or race 
where he is clearly very limited. Okay. Uh, he seems to know one NFL running back and Cornell West. <laughs> But that's all right. I, I'm not looking for him for that. Uh, so anyway, I, anyway, I, I'm just looking to replace uh, the mainstream media, uh, and 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 these folks do good work. So anyway, we're going to continue to try to contribute to that good work here at, at BPM Black Power Media. Uh, and please come back in a couple hours if you can for for more uh, on a number of different things here. I mix what I like live, and then of course the remix morning show tomorrow, uh, 8 a.m. Eastern. Uh, and with that, I really appreciate all of you, uh, or at least most of you, <laughs> and, and we'll catch you next time uh, more right here at Black Power Media. So don't go any, well, actually, do go do what you got to do and then come back here. We'll catch you in a minute. Peace if you're willing to fight for it, like Fred Hampton used to say, we'll catch you next time. I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like. I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like.